Good afternoon and welcome to this hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Council Member Ben Kalis, Chair of the Committee. As always, you can tweet me at Ben Kalis. Uh, we are joined by uh, Council Member Joe Borelli from Staten Island, who was first as always, uh, followed by uh, Carlos Menchaca, who was almost first, but for his coffee. Um, tea. Today we're holding an oversight hearing on the uh, 2017 uh, Mayor's Management Report, or the MMR. The MMR is a twice yearly report to the public and the council on the performance of municipal agencies. It is meant to be a tool for management and oversight so we at the council as well as the public can evaluate the operations of our city government. Since 2014, this committee has held multiple hearings evaluating the structure and content of the Mayor's Management Report and the preliminary Mayor's Management Report. Happy to say that the Mayor's Office of Operations has made some changes based on this committee's suggestions, which I believe improve its readability and our and the public's ability to evaluate our agencies. This new MMR in particular has some significant improvements, including spending and budget information in every chapter to show the connections between agency expenditures and agency goals including the appendices as part of the full MMR document and clearer language and definitions of terms. However, some outstanding items remain, most importantly the question of how and even whether agencies are using the document to improve performance. Today we'll seek to learn the decision-making process for which data goals and indicators are included in the MMR and when and how agencies refer to this document throughout the year as they evaluate their own performance. I want to thank Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, Emily Newman, and the De Deputy Director of Performance Management, Tina Chu, for joining us today. I also want to thank my colleagues on the committee. Look forward to our discussion today and hope it will be productive as our prior hearings. I'll now instruct our committee council to swear in our first panel. His right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Great. Good morning, Chair Kalos and other members of the Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Emily Newman, and I'm the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. I am joined today by Tina Chu, Deputy Director for Performance Management. Thank you, Chair Kalos and the rest of the committee for this opportunity to discuss the Mayor's Management Report, or the MMR, with you, and for your valuable input towards improving the MMR. As mandated by Section 12 of the New York City Charter, the Mayor reports to the public and the City Council twice a year on city agency performance. The MMR is released every September, covering the full fiscal year. A preliminary Mayor's Management Report, called the PMMR, covers the first four months of the fiscal year and is published approximately two weeks after the release of the January financial plan. The MMR and PMMR cover the operations of city agencies that report directly to the mayor. Three non-mayoral agencies are also included for a total of 44 agencies and organizations. For 40 years, the MMR has provided a public record of city agency performance, measuring whether the city is delivering vital services efficiently, effectively, and expeditiously. The MMR gives the public the information they need to evaluate the city's performance in areas like education, safety, housing, health and human services, public infrastructure, and administrative services. The MMR also highlights initiatives that cross multiple agencies and disciplines, including signature city initiatives like Thrive NYC, Vision Zero, and Housing New York. The MMR focuses on activities that have the most direct impact on New Yorkers, including activities that provide support services to other agencies. The report is organized by agency. Each agency chapter includes a description of the agency's purpose and services. Services rep represent the agency's major areas of responsibility and service delivery. Within each service area, goal statements articulate what the agency is working to achieve. Each goal statement is accompanied by key performance indicators that show whether the agency is meeting the stated goal along with narrative explanations of the agency's performance. Services, goals, and indicators are developed through collaboration between the Office of Operations and the senior managers at each agency. Services change when new responsibilities are added or transferred to agencies. Like services, goals change when a new responsibility or initiative is added to an agency's portfolio. New performance indicators are added to measure new or revised goals, uh, and they're also added when an agency's performance measurement systems and abilities mature to allow for more outcome measurements. 
Additionally, the MMR provides multiple data points and several options to evaluate performance, with three or four elements providing context for each MMR indicator. The MMR and PMMR are available via an interactive website and as PDF documents. Throughout the year, agencies also provide monthly updates on most of the critical indicators contained in the MMR and PMMR through the CPR system, or the Citywide Performance Reporting Portal. <laughs> CPR is, is publicly available on the city's website and allows users to sort information by agency and time period. CPR also provides the ability to view the five-year trends, as well as mapping information for select indicators. MMR and PMMR data can also be publicly accessed online through the city's open data portal. Over the past four years, we have made a variety of improvements to the MMR and PMMR, many in collaboration with Chair Kalos and the other members of this committee. To enhance our compliance with the city charter requirements, this year's MMR greatly expanded the information relating to the relationship between the program performance goals and the corresponding expenditures made pursuant to the adopted budget for the previous fiscal year. In consultation with OMB and the Law Department, we expanded the data available in the spending and budget tables by units of appropriation. Prior to the fiscal 2016 MMR, these tables listed agency units of appropriation only. The tables now indicate relationships between spending and agency goals wherever possible, along with expenditure and planned spending information by agency unit of appropriation. These tables have also been moved from the appendix to the body of the respective agency chapters for greater usability and increased visibility. In fiscal 2016, we added a section on agency rulemaking actions. We now include a summary of rulemaking actions taken by agency, including the total number of actions taken, the number of actions that were not in the regulatory agenda prepared for the fiscal year, and the number of rulemaking actions that were adopted under the emergency rulemaking procedures. There were no emergency actions taken in fiscal 2017. In response to helpful user feedback and requests from Chair Kalos and other members of this committee, we've combined the MMR's additional tables with the main report as an appendix. We also clarified the definition of a target in the user's guide and returned to the fiscal 2015 sampling method for the core ratings. Thank you to Chair Kalos and other members of this committee for the valuable input and collaboration on these items. Since fiscal 2014, each agency chapter has also opened with a focus on equity statement. These statements highlight the administration's commitment to effective government performance that provides fair delivery and consistent quality of services across the diverse locations and populations of our city. Agencies update their focus on equity statements as they advance their work and launch new programs and initiatives that create a New York that is fair and accessible to all residents. This year, the Mayor's Office of Operations participated in an event to recognize the 2017 National Day of Civic Hacking on September 23rd. Operations participated in the day-long NYC 311 Data Jam organized by Beta NYC in partnership with 19 community organizations and nine other city agencies. 185 people attended the Data Jam, including Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, 311 Executive Director Joe Morrisrow, and community board members. Tina Chu and members of her team worked with 13 participants to explore how agency performance could be informed and improved by providing predictive insight or highlighting equity issues by examining 311 data in conjunction with performance data from the MMR. Operations is in touch with Beta NYC to discuss ongoing engagement on the MMR and the city's performance management data. The MMR has evolved in the 40 years since its creation, and we are committed to continuing that tradition. We welcome feedback and suggestions from our partners at the Council, the public, the press, and agencies who utilize the MMR so that we can continue to make the MMR more user-friendly and more effective. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. The MMR is a product of collaboration between the Office of Operations and 44 city agencies and partners, and we're proud of the work that we do. We look forward to answering any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. We were uh, joined by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. Uh, I think I'd like to just start off with a broad question, uh, which is, uh, so, so we, we, have, we have an amazing uh, document. It is uh, 458 pages. My understanding is 40 of these are printed. Uh, how many are uh, viewed online every year?
So I have some data for you on that. We um, actually printed 45 this year. Um, and the September 2017 MMR webpage had 2,086 visits. Um, in September 2016, uh, there were 2,227 visits. Great. And oh. so I guess the, the question being in terms of what tools are the mayor, deputy mayors, agency commissioners, uh, and, and various employees using to manage ongoing campaign promises, agencies, and collaborative multi-agency programs, and is the mayor's management report that tool? Um, so the mayor's management report is certainly a tool in what I would describe as a large toolbox. Um, I can't speak to what everyone is using, but I can say that the Mayor's Office of Operations, um, and we of course work closely with agencies and the deputy mayors, um, have a number of tools. The MMR is a key tool for us. Um, also CPR, which I mentioned, um, a dashboard that we created in 2014, and a commitments tracker. And uh, I guess In terms of the dashboards and the commitment tracker, uh, how can the public or how can the council have a better understanding of those types of tools? Um, it's a great question. Um, those tools aren't public, if that's what you're asking about. Um, we do put out a report, we have put out a report annually on commitments that were made in the mayor's platform. Um, and I would imagine we will continue to provide information and updates on that. Um, the rest of the commitments that we track are tied to commitments the mayor has stated publicly, so certainly the public um, would know as well as we do what commitments he's made. So I know that the charter requires this document, and I think we are closer to the charter than we've ever been before in the previous 40 years. I guess the, the question being, uh, what steps we can take so that the commitments tracker and the dashboard and items aren't necessarily three different tools, but actually you are creating a, that the mayor's management report isn't created for the charter's sake, but is right. actually created for management's sake. Sure, so I hear you, um, and we certainly uh, do a lot of work to create the MMR twice a year, um, and we want it to be a relevant tool um, and we believe it is, but it serves a different purpose than some of the other tools that you're talking about. Um, most of the commitments that the mayor makes are around implementing new programs or making changes to programs, and the outcomes of the work that we do on that can be seen in the MMR. So I see them as sort of going together nicely, but being sort of separate tools in that regard. You mentioned uh, the CPR, which stands for Citywide Performance Reporting. Uh, can you share how that relates to the MMR? I'm going to ask Tina Chu to do that. Hi, good afternoon. So the CY performance reporting tool, as you know, is available publicly online and shows critical indicators, which are also reported via the uh, mayor's management report and the preliminary mayor's management report. Um, and not all critical indicators are reported on f on a monthly frequency, but to the degree that there is more frequent updating of information for the critical indicators, that data is available for the public to view. So we, we noticed some changes to the uh, CPR following our last hearing in terms of having uh, red, yellow, green added, uh, but um, a lot of the cities. Other websites received a refreshed appearance this session, but the CPR did not. When was the last time the website itself was updated at, to be as user-friendly as possible? Plus, we've passed, we've passed a lot of laws here in the council, and a lot of them relating to ac accessibility and other requirements. Uh, what, is the t what, what is your plan for updating the CPR? Um, that's a great question. I don't have the answer to that today. I don't know when it was last updated. Um, we would be happy to get back to you with that information as well as plans for updates and any, if there are any necessary accessibility changes, we can update you on that as well. Do 
we spent a lot of time talking about targets. Uh, following our conversations, uh, the MMR uses a broad definition of target, and uh, following our back and forth, the definition uh, was expanded and it reflects, quote, expected level of performance, comma, a maximum level of performance, uh, comma, or a minimum level to be met. Uh, in a review the, of the MMR, do you think a member of the public or even a council member would be able to look at an agency's goal table and determine whether a target is a floor, a ceiling, or an expected level of performance? Um, I, I think I hear what you're getting at. I think there are instances where, yes, it is clear, and there are probably instances where it is less so. Um, I know this has come up in previous hearings, and we are looking at whether there's um, something that we can add to the report, a symbol or something otherwise, to identify that. And that's something we're looking into for future enhancements. And I think we're, I think we're along the same lines of just, uh, and I, I know in previous hearings you've shared that there were design challenges uh, for this document, which only seems to be getting longer as we have these conversations. But uh, if you're able to make the target delineation clearer by indicating in each agency table whether the target is a goal, ceiling, or floor, uh, if, if you could commit to that as we head towards the PMMR, we would be very happy to see that in the next iteration. I I can certainly commit that we are exploring it. I don't know that we can commit to having it in the PMMR, but we are looking into it and appreciate your feedback on it. From the MMR's user guide, uh, quote, a desired direction of none, parentheses, indicated by an asterisk, and parentheses, replaces the term quote, neutral, unquote, used in prior reports, unquote. Out of 528 critical indicators, there are 87 with no desired direction, 71 with no target, and 15 with a target but no desired direction. Uh, one might say we, 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 we as a city might have no direction in some of these situations. Uh, what is the reasoning behind choosing to apply no desired direction or no target to critical indicators. And this number hasn't changed since we've brought this to your attention in previous years. So I will start, and I um, will likely need Tina to finish. Um, but there are things that are important to track that the city um, has trouble setting an indi uh, sorry a direction for. Um, 311 calls is a great example. We always want people to be aware of 311 and able to call 311 anytime they need something, but at the same time, um, we hope that some of the issues that they complain about, um, call to complain about, will go down. So it's sort of hard to set a target when you want both of those things. Um, it's hard to identify whether you want the number to go up or down, and there are a number of indicators that are like that. Uh, and I'd like to add that that's of the critical indicators we're talking about something around like 16 to 17 percent of critical indicators with a desired direction of none. And as Emily had mentioned, many of these are re in relation to what we call sort of demand indicators. So that's partially why you will see, um, for instance, uh, an indicator such as uh, patrol summonses issued for illegal street hails under Taxi and Limousine Commission. Um, it would be very hard to interpret whether you would want what, why you would want that number to go down versus why you would want it to go up. Um, because what we want is just sort of a clear reckoning and tr statistical tracking of the demand that's available and not necessarily saying that we as a city want the demand to go up or down when it's not something that we're supposed to be influencing that we actually need to take a neutral stance on. So I want to just take a moment to thank my uh, excellent uh, committee staff. Uh, we have our uh, council, uh, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Kronk, and Zach Harris, who have done a lot of great work. So we, we went through some of the 
critical indicators. So DCAS has a critical indicator termed, quote, annual estimated reduction in greenhouse ga gas emissions from all energy projects, parentheses, measured in metric tons, and parentheses, end quote. Uh, and so I believe in global warming. I believe in climate change. I believe that climate change is human, uh, human powered. We, we, we've, we've brought this on ourselves. And so I believe that reducing our gas greenhouse ga gas emissions is important, and so does this mayor. Uh, and uh, th thank, thank all for that. Uh, but the fiscal year 17 target was 4,269 metric tons. Uh, the fiscal year 2018 target is 50,229 metric tons, which is great. But there's no desired direction, despite there being a definite increase in reductions over the past five years. So seems like that one should be an easy one. We, we should want to increase the reduction in greenhouse gases, and that is a critical indicator, and it should be one. And I think this is one of dozens of examples. That's a great example. We agree with you on um, climate change and all the other things that you spoke about. Um, I don't think we're in a position right now to talk about specific agency metrics. Tina can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but we would be happy to look into this and any others of the 87 um, that you reviewed um, and get back to you. And, and so I think we'll continue on this line of questioning and just around how often and how are the targets assessed, for instance, Department of Environmental Protection has a performance indicator termed, quote, average time to repair or replace high priority broken or inoperative hydrants. I think this one is critical and important because we want to make sure that when there's a fire, the hydrants work. The target is set at seven days, and for the last five years, DEP has managed to maintain an average repair time of 2.7 and 3.1 days. Can we determine it is time to lower the target, which we hope is a ceiling in this case? So as, uh, as we have mentioned previously, there are different types of information available to help gauge um, performance. So obviously with a five-year trend, as you can see, the, the trend is good, stable below the target and with that desired direction. So in some cases, the target changing, uh, and let me just back up a second. Um, just a, also a reminder that desired direction is an attribute of the indicator and not of the target itself. So even if there is a desired direction of down, that does not mean that we are assessing targets um, and asking every time for a target to be changing in a desired direction. So as I think Emily had mentioned in her statement, you can look at performance year to year over long-term trends and look at continuous performance also, and you can also look at it in relation to targets. So if performance is doing well and targets aren't necessarily changing, uh, that may not be our highest priority in determining whether or not a target should be changing. I think the place where we continue to have an dis ongoing discussion is if I set a target for somebody, I believe that they should work towards that target. Uh, and I understand that actual performance uh, may out be, be even better than that target, but at that point, that's when I think it's a good time to come back and reassess the target. Uh, and so. Given the fact that if there's ever a fire, you want to know that that fire hydrant is working, and given the fact that the DEP has been doing such a good job, can we lower it from uh, seven days to four days or even three and a half days, given that it has never gone beyond 3.1 days? It's um, certainly not a, deci a decision that we can make on our own. We work closely with our agency partners. We'd be happy to talk to DEP. Um, explore this specific um, target and get back to you. And I, I guess the larger question is, how does that process work? Who has the final say? Where, where does the buck stop? So if we, if we are here 
at the preliminary budget, and this hasn't changed. Is it because of DEP? Is it because of Mayor's Office of Operations? Is it because of the, deputy, the first deputy mayor? Is it because of the mayor himself? Where does the buck stop? Um, so it is really ultimately a collaboration between um, us and the agencies. Uh, certainly, if or when needed, um, we can always go to our bosses. Um, but we really work very closely with the agencies and um, talk through these things and really have a good collaborative relationship to reach a decision. So an another example, and this is th the last example on this specific track, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings Oath has a performance indicator termed, quote, the average time for Oath Trials Division to issue decisions after record closes and business days. End of quote. The target has been set at 25 days, and for the last five years, Oath has managed to issue decisions within less than 16 days, improving to 7.5 days in the last three years. We see that the fiscal year 2018 target appears to have been adjusted to 15 days, which looks like a common sense adjustment of a target based on their actual performance. Can you tell us whether you prompted this change or if Oath did? We don't have details on it today. Uh, we're, okay. We'd be happy to get back to you. No worries. And how do targets relate to national targets and trends? That would depend on the, obviously, the agency and the industry and the type of service being performed. I think we've, in past hearings, talked about 311 um, and having, as a call center, actually having a particular type of industry standard. Um, in some other cases, we've mentioned, I think previously as well, so ACS, trying to use particular types of um, indicators and standards. Um, but that, I don't have a wholesale answer for how all the indicators relate to national standards. And as um, you're probably familiar with, many people will say that New York City is a very different kind of um, place and that national standards may not apply uh, in a, across the board. Would you commit to where we're using a national standard, also adding some sort of indication in the MMR so that we can see when we're looking at a national standard versus a floor, a ceiling, or an actual target? It's a great idea, and we'll definitely commit to exploring it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to turn it, uh, sorry, one, one last item on this line. Will you commit to making recommendations to all agencies to readjust their targets to better suit the five-year trends as exemplified in the report for the next MMR? We've seen <laughs> one of the favorite things that I like is at the end of every single section, uh, there is a, a notable changes. Uh, and, and what you may notice is for the GovOps agencies, uh, which, which may be my favorites, uh, their list of notable changes is often a page long. Other agencies may not get that same treatment. Will you commit to working with the other non-GovOps agencies to bring their uh, targets in line with their five-year trends? I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? Uh, will you work with the 40 mayoral agencies that are included in this book and whichever others may be added in the future uh, to readjust their targets based on their five-year trends. We will take a look at that. Okay. Uh, so typically chairs ask questions for quite a while before members, but I try to defer to members so that they can ask their questions and get to their uh, next event, so I still have quite more questions, but I did want to uh, defer to Council Member uh, Carlos Menchaca to follow up on a line of questioning that he has been engaged in for uh, previous hearings. Thank you, Chair, and welcome uh, to this public hearing. And uh, the Chair is correct in, in, in saying that this has kind of been a line of, of questions for me, very important as a Chair of the Immigration Committee and really trying to think about uh, a couple lines in the in your director's message to try to get this out to the public. Our public, uh, our public is a diverse public, and kind of want to get a sense from you 
I think the last time we talked, maybe it was maybe six months or a year, over almost a year now, that we talked a little bit about, about language access and things that the office was going to do to make efforts towards that. One, in compliance to the law, but also other ways that we can get information out. I have some pieces of legislation that I'm exploring that I think had good intentions, but I think found um, some some important kind of moments to pause about how to get more of this out to different places like libraries. Um, so can you tell us a little bit and just give us a quick sense about what you're doing right now to get more, uh, more of these reports out to more people? Sure. Um, uh, I think we've certainly heard your, your feedback in the past, um, especially about language access. Um, I, don't, I can't speak to getting it out to specific sites. I don't know if Tina can add to that. Um, but in terms of making the book something that more people can use, um, I'll just reiterate that we do want this to be something that's useful to others. We've put a lot of work into it and think the content is very valuable. Um, and we want everyone to be able to use it, utilize it regardless of language. Um, so we have been doing some homework um, on that. Um, translation uh, can be very time consuming. And so one of the concerns we have is how current the data is. Um, from what we've found so far, it can take anywhere from four months to a year to translate this book per language. Um, and so obviously, a year later, the content's not especially current. Um, it's both the length of the book as well as how technical the content is um, that can cause that. So um, it is something that we're very interested in doing. Um, and, and that's what we've sort of been able to uh, find out so far. We've been talking with Moya, and we're going to continue to explore. Thank you for that. And I, I do want to say that I know this is difficult. Uh, I think all our district offices experience this kind of tension or challenge with communication to things that are important and critical for, for communities. The more a crisis, the more information around a crisis, um, the higher the crisis and need to get information out, the higher the priority, and that's where we focus. Um, we can't do everything all the time, and, and that's just all based out of capacity and resources. And so I think this is an, a good conversation to have citywide, and so I'm hoping that maybe you can really help us jo join our thinking on this and figure out how, how, how to think about it differently, because we do have limited resources. And there are, there's a, there, there are pieces of information that are critical for communities that are going to are making decisions on their own about how to interact with community, and I think your your opening kind of message I think says it says it all about about the issues that are really important to communities like workforce and serving the public, and and maybe I'll pause there and take a step back and say or ask this question, who? Because um, it's a question that I kept on asking after my series of questions about a year ago, who uses this? And do I want a PTA parent to use this? Is that, is that my goal? Question mark. I do not know. Do I want a sixth grade student to put this in their hands and say, hey, can you use this to help our community? Who you, and I know that's your answer. Um, and I, am, I do not know the answer to that, I, mostly because I just don't know if this is, this is an, even in the right language in English to get to people so that they can use this for a purpose that is not only identified, understood, supported, and, and that, is, that is thoughtful about, about this. So, so back to the question, who uses this report right now? Who, who do you know uses this on a daily basis? And uh, I think I know the answer to that, but I want to kind of hear what your, th what your research tells you. Great. Um, Tina might have some info to add, but first, thank you for le reading my letter. You're maybe one of a couple, yeah. um, so thank you. Um, uh, I think that's a great question. I think that is an important question as we think about ongoing enhancements, um, and I don't know, you know, no one has to report back to us on the fact that they've downloaded and read our report, um, but I think primarily it's used by folks um, in and around city government, oh. um, and the press. Um, we, you know, we want to be transparent. We want folks to have access to the information that they want to have access to or should have access to. Um, but whether this is a read that a PTA parent might enjoy, 
Probably not. Um, and so I think, I think it's a fair question. Tina, do you have any additions on the audience? I think Emily sort of hit the high notes in terms of the organizations and, and individuals who you would expect to be using this document, people who have, uh, who are really trying to focus on what performance looks like agency by agency, initiative by initiative, uh, whether that can move all the way down towards, you know, a sixth grader. It would be really wonderful if that could work. Um, but uh, I think, as you said, there is a tension between being as plain language as possible and dealing with processes that are fairly difficult to describe and to render accurately um, given legal terminology, et cetera. Um, but going towards um, opportunities uh, for, by which we can provide more of this information, um, at least the larger distribution of information, not sure how people will actually use it though, we have been putting our information, our data sets on open data uh, with all the definitions and uh, uh, metadata that's required through the open data law, and we are getting more views of those particular um, uh, data sets. We also have, as Emily mentioned in her testimony, we have participated in um, a civic technology hackathon and data jam and uh, are considering ways of um, using opportunities like that in the future uh, to, I think, importantly, not just distribute, but get into contact with people who have questions about this data set. One of the experiences that came out of that particular um, event was that, to be honest, that was the first hackathon I've been to in any capacity. Um, and it was very helpful uh, to hear from the organizers as well as the participants that um, this was not just to try to create products, but it was a way to get feedback and to uh, engage in sort of ongoing education um, and information sessions. And I think that's a good example for us to continue to consider um, how we can use those types of venues to get a broader audience um, and help those audiences also then increase exposure to the, the information and the system that we use to develop performance management and report on it. That's really exciting to hear that you are, you are participating in those kind of settings, hackathons. These are, these are people who understand technology and understand the kind of uh, user base experience for, for a whole bunch of different data that, that gets extrapolated and, and regurgitated into digestible uh, formats like a phone. So that's, it was that the first time that you were there or was it the first time that the, the office was there? This is the first time that the mayor's manage report has been part of a hackathon. This was actually part of a 311 related uh, event and um, the mayor's office of data and analytics which is part of operations has participated in this and, and several other hackathons before. Well, again, I think I think there's there's some fruitful ground to gain here in those in those spaces, and so I'd like to hear that, that that's happening more and more because I think that breaks us away from the format that I think is is difficult for non policy policy oriented people, and I think that the intention of the chair is a good one, which is a sixth grader should be able to use this and say I have an idea or I want to confirm an idea or how are we doing on X Y Z, like that's that's the goal that. They're voting, sixth graders are voting for participatory budget uh, projects and they're creating those projects and that's happening in a lot of our districts. So that, that, is, that is the intention. The question is how, how, do we, how do we get this information to them and to us as policymakers so that we can, we can join in, in it. Um, I, it begs me to ask how, do you, do you have a sense of how much it takes both in staff time and dollars to create this on a yearly basis? Is that is that is that amount uh, is that a known amount? It's not. Um, I don't have a cost for the book itself. We could talk a little bit about. And I guess I'm talking about the like team. the data crunching and like. Sure. How, is, I mean, how, it's it has a lot of tentacles. We've got a team under Tina who's fantastic and works lots of hours to put this together, um, and then they've got contacts within each agency who sort of right. are the liaisons who work with program folks throughout right. the agency. So. I don't think we could articulate everyone, but we can certainly talk about our team. Yeah. It's just an inter interesting question to ask about the resources that are being used right now and how, how, the, ten how, how the tentacles are, 
are kind of constructed so that they can kind of move to produce other forms of, of, of outcomes that look differently. But I do also know that, that there are a lot of laws that are created to make this too. So, so the laws are kind of forcing a very particular kind of thing that I'm, I'm not aware of right now. And so I don't know if you have a, an answer to that as far as how much of this is by law. Um, this is 40, year, 40 years now. Uh, so is this, is this predominantly a legal mandate completely? I know a lot of it is, but, and we were changing laws to create more and more subject matters, et cetera, but, but can you give us a, a texture about what, what that, how much of this pertains to, to legal mandate? Um, probably, I would say probably about like 80 to 90 percent of it is clearly stipulated within the city charter. And uh, we have been, you know, working very hard to make sure that we are living up to the spirit and the letter of the charter mandate. Uh, there are a number of components of the report that aren't mandatory, but that are included including the collaboration chapters and some of the information related in the um, additional tables slash appendix. Awesome. Look, this is very interesting, and I want to continue to help not only on language access, but just access in general and bringing... We're, we're creating armies of people who are very interested in government and are civically engaged and want to expand from participatory budgeting because they, they're getting A pluses in that realm of, of capital uh, a capital eligibility, and so I th there, there are people that are going to want to expand. This is a great, great bridge uh, to to expand into when your subject matters span so many different agencies that they are impacted by on a daily basis. So there's there's only room, I think, for improvement. Let's keep doing that work, and let's just see you at more and more hackathons. I think that's where we're going to all start seeing the future there about how we can digest data uh, in the places that we're all digesting data right now. Where fake news rules the day, and we can actually bring good information to people through these venues. Thank you. Great vision. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Menchaca, we've been joined by Council Members at Greenfield and Levine. I want to just uh, say that I have this middle school in my district, Eastside Middle School, and I would love if Mayor's Office of Operations would consider presenting the MMR, and I promise they would eat it up, and I'm wondering if Carlos has a middle school in his district that might be up. Which middle school? MS88. They have an incredible principal's council. They're already advising me on land use, so <laughs> they're already expanding. They're already expanding, but. So we will have MS88 and Eastside Middle School here at City Hall to uh, learn about the MMR, another I feel like that, that we can commit to. Perfect. That's also, it, it stands to reason that I think almost 10%, if not more, of all the MMRs for this year in existence are in this room right now, and every member of this committee has asked for a copy of it. So if those can be made available, and if you would consider printing more MMRs, at least for our committee, I see members of the public from the Citizens Budget Committee who would like a copy too. Uh, so uh, perhaps we can do that. Uh, with regards to uh, the uh, data jam, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard, but in addition to being an attorney, I uh, also am a software developer. Uh, and I often go to hackathons, and would it be possible for uh, me as chair, or, if I, or just as a software developer, to be included in data jams through the Mayor's Office of Operations? Sure, absolutely. We'll Great. keep you and updated as we plan to join others. And the Mayor just announced something called NYCX. Uh, where instead of just asking people to put in their volunteer time, we might actually pay people for their software development expertise to take on challenges. And to the ex uh, w would Mayor's Office of Operations commit to working with uh, Miguel Gamino and NYCX to see whether or not there is room for including the mayor's management and, and this type of problem set that we're dealing with in the X challenges? I can certainly commit to having a conversation with Miguel to see what would make sense. I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Council Member uh, Levine, who happens to chair the Parks Committee, who has some specific questions with relation to those targets. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am unfortunately neither an attorney nor a software developer, but I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm going to do great. Um, I do want to ask you about some parks-related measures. Is that a union hotel, Council Member? <laughs> I'm just asking that you, that you mentioned it. I'll check that. Okay. 
Um, so the number of crimes in New York City parks is up. Uh, for fiscal year 2017, that was driven by an increase in property crimes. I believe that for the first quarter of this fiscal year, not reflected in this report, there was an additional rise and that it also included a rise in non-property uh, felonies. Um, do you have an explanation for this trend? I do not have that, but we can look into it for you. Okay. Um, I think looked at against the context of a broader crime rate, which is dropping, which we're incredibly thankful for, uh, what seems to be a steady, slow but steady rise in crime reported in parks uh, should be a cause for concern and one that I haven't heard an adequate explanation for. It sounds like you were going to add something on that. No? Okay. I, I was just going to add um, we are more than happy to talk about the parks metrics, and um, I think your concern makes a lot of sense. Um, but we are really in a position today to talk to about specific agency indicators, um, but more the MMR structure overall. So okay. we're happy to talk through it with you, but it's really a question for the agency. All right, so this, then I'll try and ask a question which may be more in line with that, which concerns how the Parks Department reports on its capital projects, um, which are reported to be completed on time or early, uh, at a rate of 85%. Now, we have unpacked this in recent hearings. So what I've learned is that that reflects the on-time rate for only one stage of the capital process, uh, which is construction. Uh, it, it does not take into account the time between when a project is fully funded and when design begins doesn't take into account how long the design process lasts, doesn't take into account how long procurement lasts. It takes into account only how long construction lasts, and it's only a measure versus the goal. And since I don't know what, how we define on time, uh, it's possible that even at that fourth stage, we have such a long expectation on how long construction takes that it makes it pretty easy to declare projects on time. I can tell you the big picture uh, is uh, unacceptable that even routine, fairly modest parks capital projects can drag into four, five, six, even beyond that, years between when a project is funded and when the ribbon is cut. Um, and we don't have to relitigate that right now, but I think part of the problem is we're measuring the wrong thing. And until we held oursel hold ourselves accountable for the true metric of duration of capital projects, which is how long projects take from the moment they're funded, when they're announced to the public, and when the public begins to follow the, the capital process, to the moment when those projects are completed, we're never going to fix this. It's uh, one, one, management 101 uh, is if, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And if we're only measuring one piece of this and we're only doing it in a way that's just on time versus whatever that long expectation was, we're not going to solve this. Um, why can't we just have a metric here which is percent of capital, average duration of capital projects? How many years does it take from start to finish? Or percent of capital projects which are completed in three years or less? Uh, why can't we just measure it that way? Um, I don't have an answer for you on why we can't or if we can't, um, but I'm happy to explore how we come up with these and why we've chosen this and whether there's something else that would make sense. Who makes the decision of what each department measures? Do, do agencies themselves decide or? We do it in collaboration with the agencies. I think this needs to be pushed at all levels and uh, I think that the mayor's office needs to set very clear directives on this. Uh, I believe in this case that the failure to measure has allowed this problem uh, to 
to fester. And uh, I'll close because I've used up a lot of time, but I think it's critical that we measure what matters in the capital process, which is very, very simple. How long are the projects taking? That's what we need to measure, and I believe until we do this, we're never going to tackle this problem. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you to our, our uh, esteemed member of this committee and Parks Committee Chair, and I hope that in the, the next council, when we do MMR and PMMR hearings, we do it with all the agencies so that all the various chairs will be able to do so. We've been joined by Council Member uh, Richie Torres, and we have questions from Council Member David Greenfield. Hello, how are you? Thanks for coming out and testifying today. Um, no complaints, sorry to disappoint, generally happy with, I said I have no complaints, I know you're surprised. Hear. You're like, what? <laughs> Council member has no complaints, how is that possible? Uh, I'm happy with uh, the general uh, work and the feedback and the outline. I know this takes obviously a lot of efforts. I'm just curious about a couple of things. Uh, I just want to clarify uh, just from an uh, operation standpoint, and then I just have one uh, question as well. So uh, essentially this is self-reported. Is that, is that really how it works? I'm just trying to understand the, the metric that we have over here. So like, I'm, I'm looking at sanitation, for example. Is this a self-report, the agency's self-report? And I guess I'm curious as to what quality control sort of exists to make sure that the self-reporting is accurate. Anybody can take that, there's no, I have no biases in favor of either one of you. So it, it is coming from agency information, but it does, in some cases for certain indicators, these are also pulling from other systems that they are using. So there's quality on their end, we have sort of our, um, our own teams looking at this data and making sure that we're taking a look at whether this is uh, being inputted properly, but also other parts of operations, uh, including the team that works on this report, do try to understand very clearly what the processes are that the agencies are using um, to collect the information, report on it, and have it reflect what's actually happening on the ground. Okay, my second question is, uh, your office, the Mayor's Office of Operation, are you data neutral? That is to say, do you just say, okay, that's interesting, or do you flag things and go back and be like, well, hold on a second over here, guys, this, this is a problem. What position do you take on that? I'm just curious as to how you interact with the other agencies. Um, we are not data neutral. Um, we have a lot of opinions. Um, I'd we, love to hear them. <laughs> if there's any agencies you're not satisfied with, now would be a good opportunity for you to air those grievances. I'm gonna, We're getting I'm close gonna, to the holiday of uh, Festivus. Spice. Uh, Familiar with Festivus? Uh -huh. We're getting close to that holiday. Earing the grievances is an important yes. part of that yes, holiday. Yes, we'll regroup then. As a multicultural individual myself, I try to celebrate other um, holidays, especially TV ones, because they're entertaining. Of course, most important. Um, we certainly review what's in the MMR uh, along with the data that comes out of other trackers like the CPR. Um, and when we see something concerning, we do think it's important to flag it, explore it. Um, and that may be sort of at a staff level, our folks talking with the folks at agencies. Um, it may be me reaching out to an agency head or even flagging something to deputy mayors at City Hall. Um, not every issue that we see sort of has the same weight. Some things are higher priority than others. Some things sure. are more complex than others. So sort of how we respond and what we do varies. Um, but we do certainly pay attention and address it in one way or another. Got it. Okay. That's helpful to know. And then just specifically, and once again, I know you're not an agency, so I know you may not know this. Just I noticed something that's interesting. I'm actually very pleased about this, which is that the streets rated acceptably clean in the sanitation uh, uh, department, while those are neutral, the streets rated filthy are down. Good news, less filthy streets. I'm actually very proud of this because we had, we had a previous mayor, you may have known him, his name was Michael Bloomberg, and one of the first pieces of legislation that I passed was to get rid of these, uh, what I thought were unlawful stickers that used to stick these ugly neon stickers on your car if you forgot to move the car on Alton side parking. And we had once a very public debate and he said, oh, you know, you, you, if you pass this legislation, the streets are going to get very dirty here in New York City because no one's going to move their cars. And, and, you know, he's a very smart guy, so occasionally I like to prove that I actually outwitted him on this one because the streets are getting cleaner in New York City and we're not uh, making people suffer because they accidentally forgot to move their cars. So that's a good, good thing. I'm just curious, uh, do you know how much of this is related to the alternate side parking in terms of uh, the cleanliness that you rely on for the alternate side parking piece of this? 
Is that a necessary piece of your cleaning operation? I say this because people always hate alternate side parking, and people always say, oh, if only we could just get, get rid of alternate side parking. Is that happening anytime soon? Can we get rid of alternate side parking? So unless Tina feels otherwise, I don't have an answer to that. I can't yeah. speak to the specifics of the agency indicators. I'd be happy to talk to sanitation, or I would just ask you to talk with sanitation, who knows this far better than we do. OK. Do you have an opinion on this? No. So my final question, I guess, would be is something that we actually have seen, and it's been frustrating for some of my constituents, once again, not blaming you because you got the data. I'm certainly not going to yell at the person who gave me the data, right? So and I'm actually grateful uh, for that and would love one of these copies as well if you can send them my way. You can uh, bill them to uh, the city council. Um, the the uh, violations for dirty sidewalks have gone up precipitously. They've, they've gone up some 25% over the last couple of years, and we've been hearing that from people who are constituents who are upset and frustrated by that number has gone up, but the street, the, the cleanliness of the streets stayed roughly the same. So, there is, so it's difficult to make the argument, well, okay, you know, because we gave out 25% more tickets, we're now getting cleaner streets. So some folks would argue that may be seen as a revenue tool, perhaps, once again, not passing judgment on you. I'm just curious as to whether this is an issue that perhaps you may have noticed or flagged. I'm referring to page 126. Under Service 1, Goal 1A, violations issued for dirty sidewalks, they've gone up rather significantly uh, in this administration. They started off at around 28,000 tickets, and now we're up to 65,702. So that's uh, over twice as many sidewalk tickets. So what, what say you on that? Is that something that you may have noticed or that you may have flagged or didn't really fit into your criteria? And if not, perhaps you might consider going back and saying, hey, I have this annoying council member who says that you guys are giving out too many sidewalk tickets, and clearly we're not getting much from it because the cleanliness is staying the same. What do you think? I think it's going to be pretty hard to know what the causal relationship is exactly between those two particular items, but it's definitely something we can take a look at and um, investigate further. All right. I mean, you would agree with me that in theory, the purpose of giving sidewalk tickets is because you want to have cleaner streets, right? Is that fair? Correct. But we don't know whether there's like a direct relationship. No, no, I understand that. But I'm saying it's not, it's not, you know, it's not like out of the blue, right? There is some argument that is generally made that we give sidewalk, dirty sidewalk tickets because we want to have cleaner streets. I mean, that's a fair observation, perhaps. I just want to make sure that you agree with the premise we agree with the premise. You agree with the premise. Okay. Once again, I'm not blaming you. I'm just, I just want to make sure I'm in the ballpark of the question, right? So one would think that if you gave more dirty sidewalk tickets that the streets would be cleaner, and they're not, and therefore... The streets yeah. um, that are rated filthy are going down, so there does seem to be a correlation there. Again, I can't speak to the agency okay. metrics. 0.2 to 0.1%, um, but yeah, I'm just um, saying... There's a lot of streets and sidewalks. I know, but I, I would argue that might even be within the margin of error, right? You know, 99.98 versus 99.9. .9. And by the way, just so you know, for the record, I want the record to reflect, I love the sanitation department. They're one of my favorite agencies. I think they're awesome and they do great work. Just don't like the fact that my constituents feel like they're, they're seeing an increase on the dirty sidewalk tickets when and their argument is that their sidewalks are not, in fact, dirty. You know, like the wrapper blows on, and that's it. So I'm not a complainer. I just wanted to make you aware of this, bring it to your attention, and you should do the fine work that you do, which is to flag it for the agencies, the deputy mayor, or whomever, and just get that information back and duly note it. And then I'm pleased, and like I said, I actually appreciate it. I've actually think, I've, seen, I've been looking at these things for around eight years. I think they've actually got a lot more easier to read these management reports, is that fair as well? We agree. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the transparency and the effort to make it simpler for average New Yorkers to figure out what's happening in the city. So overall, I'm pleased, simply wanted to provide some feedback and hope that you'll get that feedback to the proper agencies. And if they wouldn't mind you know, sending us a note just explaining that, that would be super helpful. So thank we'll you very you. much. And uh, um, I also would like to state for the record that if you're taking investors, I'm a big believer in your abilities. I'd be happy to invest in your uh, uh, programming business or tech startup or whatever it is that you're doing there because I like the uh, I like your style and your vision so let me know if I can get in on the ground floor I'm always looking for the next Google or uh, Uber or something like that I appreciate it uh, sadly in 2016 we eliminated outside income and I had to wind down everything I was doing which I actually did in 2014 when I got elected so you the record reflect that uh, chair Kalos would be a billionaire but for the fact that the council has imposed these rules and regulations, and that's the kind of dedication that he has to our city, and I thank you for that, Chair Kalos. For, 
Uh, I just want to follow along with where uh, Councilmember Greenfield was going, uh, which is just in terms of vetting some of the data. So uh, it says that sidewalks are rated acceptably clean, and it's been in the 90 percent of the time. And I just want to do a, a poll of my colleagues here. Uh, how many of you feel that you, you only get complaints about uh, uh, dog feces on sidewalks or dirty sidewalks or other items only 5% of, of, of the time and that 95% of your streets do not have any of those problems? So, so Our trouble zones, to be clear. We have certain trouble spots. Is that, is that what the Chair is saying? I, 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 I would say that uh, more than... I would say less than 95% of the streets in my district are, are dog feces or, or uh, are, are dog poop free. Uh, and, and I would also say that less than 95% of them would be rated as Oh, we have persistent constituents is what you're saying, who like to complain about certain issues. I'm saying I get tweets with pictures of this every single day. People tweet at you dog feces? That's disgusting. <laughs> we should do something about that in the Twitter terms of service. <laughs> Apparently, you can threaten thermonuclear war and send pictures of bad conditions in the streets, but reporting sexual harassment is a problem. So, we so, noted. Uh, but I, I guess that when you get numbers that seem a little bit like false positives, what, what is your method for looking at it, and what data set are they using to determine how the streets are rated? So street cleanliness is uh, actually one of the one of the surveys that is performed by the um, scorecard unit, which is part of the mayor's office of operations, and it does uh, this work throughout the city in rating conditions of street and sidewalk cleanliness. So this is um, not based on this is based on direct direct observation with a methodology um, that has been in place, uh, I believe, uh, and, and been continuously reported, um, I believe, since 19, the late 1970s. Um, so it's performed by a sort of dedicated team who knows how to look at these conditions and report on them. So it is not based on sort of calls coming in about you know, particular items that are happening on a particular day. So um, is that? I, I, I guess the concern is it seems that all of us have hotspots, and to the extent those hotspots could be, if Mayor's Office of Operation could ask council members to flag hotspots, and if those could be included or weighted. Another piece that just a little bit troubled me in terms of the interaction with my colleague was just um, I'm a big believer in tying, uh, on getting a return on investment. So, if we are writing violations in order to have cleaner sidewalks, I would like that to be explicit, and I would like to know we are right. We are spending this many dollars on writing this many violations, and those many violations resulting in this much in fines, and those much in fines results in this increase in it, so that we can decide whether or not that's a good use of our resources. We, under a previous administration, the belief was that the more we stopped and frisked people that uh, that would reduce the crime. And what we found under this administration, where many of us were against stop and frisk, is when that was completely scaled back and not used as a tool anymore, the city still got safer, which meant that these two items weren't linked. Is there a division within mayor's office of operations or in the city that is studying the links between the actions that the city is taking and the results? and? whether there is a link and whether there are results to speak of? Um, it's a great question. It's not something that we're doing as part of the MMR, um, and it's not something that we are doing across the board. Um, I would say on certain um, projects, certain initiatives, um, things like that certainly do come up that we explore. Uh, would you? I'm not sure. I, I believe the right place might be the mayor's office of operations. In other places, it's often called the nudge unit or something like that. But getting a group of folks in to figure out, to, to tie the city's actions to the desired results and whether or not the actions we're taking are actually having a positive or negative impact or any impact at all. Sure. Yeah, we can keep talking about that. Um, we do a lot of 
you know, tracking for the high priority projects that we work on that sort of make sure that the investment we're putting in is paying off. Um, you're talking about doing something broader than that? As, I think as, as broad as possible as we look at our assumptions and ensuring that Councilmember Greenfield asked whether or not alternate side of the street parking actually re, uh, ends up in cleaner streets. I know there are certain districts that have scaled back alternate side of the street parking. Uh, I think that government often makes decisions without using the scientific method. I, I've been mocked on Twitter for saying these things, but I, I'm a big believer in the scientific method and believe that if we test our hypotheses and, and do pilots and study them, we can figure out whether or not things have the desired uh, effect that we're seeking. Um, no, no, I was just, so, so, so I, yeah. Uh, I, I've gone on. Uh, I'd like to recognize Councilmember Torres for his questions. For the record, I too believe in the scientific method, so. No. What um, about global warming? I, I don't know about that. I, I take my cues from the president, I suppose. Um, so I, have a, I might go into the, the weeds a bit because I'm noticing I'm on the section dedicated to health and hospitals. And as you might know, our public hospital system or Medicaid in general is undergoing a massive restructuring under an initiative known as DISRIP, right? And so you have public hospitals, safety net hospitals that are receiving billions of dollars with an eye toward reducing preventable hospitalizations. That's the central performance indicator. And I don't see that indicator in this report. So it's odd that the central indicator of the leading <laughs> Medicaid initiative in the state is nowhere to be found in the section dedicated to health and hospitals. So that is like, how do you arrive at these performance indicators? Do you ensure that these performance indicators are consistent with ongoing initiatives at the city, state, or federal level? Because that seems to me a glaring absence. And maybe I'm misreading, but I cannot find it. Reductions in preventable hospitalizations or? Uh, so it would be helpful maybe if you, if we can follow up on this. Okay. To, to get the specific item that you're considering um, because I don't want to speak out of turn for, uh, for the agency and also for a very complicated set of indicators around health and hospitals, but we can look into it definitely for you. Um, the more specific you can be, the more, more we can kind of take So, so what about the question of how you arrive at these performance indicators? Do you simply go by what the agency recommends, or do you look at larger initiatives that are guiding the policies of those agencies? But All of the above. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear an answer. And how do you measure progress, right? Because you could measure progress in relation to what was accomplished in the year before. So I'm noticing with Metro Plus membership, the, tra the trajectory is upward, therefore you consider it progress. But I also know that Health and Hospitals has its own strategic goals in relation to Metro membership, that it wants it to reach a certain number by 2020. Like, do you evaluate progress toward the goals that agencies set for themselves rather than progress in relation to what was accomplished the year before? I don't know if that's a clear question. I think the, the way the MMR is set up is that you can look at it in multiple ways in terms of progress. You have the long-term trends, you have the year-to-year -year comparisons, you have the comparison against the target for the, for the year itself. There's also the narrative that talks about how they're performing and why they're performing in that manner. So there are, we want to give users various ways to look at progress. Yeah, I, that, this does not tell me that. So it tells me that there's been an increase in Metro Plus membership. It does not tell me the progress that Health and Hospitals has made toward achieving its own strategic objectives. So I think that, um, I think that what you're asking about is separate from the MMR. The MMR is an accountability tool. Um, we've got... Um, uh, can I just interrupt for a moment? Yeah. What, if, if I set goals, the progress that I make toward achieving those goals would seem to me the essence of accountability. I think that that's fair. Um, I think that we, we have the MMR that tracks sort of the key functions of each agency. Um, we also have a lot of other ways that we track agency success towards things that they've committed to doing. And a lot of this sort of um, strategic initiatives um, can fall into that. They ultimately impact the numbers that will be seen here. Um, but we have a lot of different ways that we track things depending on what they are. Um, 
I'm not personally familiar yeah. with this, so I apologize. I just it, I feel like there's a difference between telling me trajectory and telling me progress, right? This the information here is telling me the trajectory of Metro Plus membership. It's not telling me the extent of progress that Health and Hospitals has made toward achieving its goals. And in the end, as a policymaker whose core function is oversight, I'm more interested in progress than I am in trajectory. So that, that, that would be a criticism that I would have of the report. Um, are there any metrics in here relating to the opioid epidemic? We're in the midst of a probably the worst opioid epidemic that we've seen in decades, and I know there are a number of agencies that have a role in distributing naloxone kits or in administering naloxone with an eye toward preventing fatal opioid overdoses. Are we measuring the, the role that each agency is playing in preventing fatal overdoses? Are those metrics included in, anywhere in this report? Uh, in the Department of Health section, there is the metric around um, deaths in relation to overdoses. In the Thrive NYC chapter, uh, there are, I, th I think there is one specific indicator around naloxone kits distributed. Note that the collaboration chapters are sort of, um, are multi-agency initiatives. Is it broken down by agency? Will it, would it tell me the number of kits that have been distributed by the corrections department and by the NYPD and by? We don't disaggregate in that manner. And I think part of it is uh, we can talk with Thrive about that idea. Yeah. Um, but it is, as a general rule, a little bit more difficult to track disaggregated indicators, but we can look into how that would be more helpful. And, and as far as cooperation, because you're not only measuring the performance of city agencies, you're measuring the performance of the functional equivalent of city agencies, public benefit corporations, public authorities, do you elicit less cooperation from NYCHA or Health and Hospitals than you would from a run-of-the-mill city agency? Like, how is your interaction different, if, if at all? It could be the same, for all I know. But. So we actually only include three non-city agencies in the book, which I have right here. Okay. Um, we have the Board of Elections, CUNY, um, and the libraries that are included. So uh, there are a number of folks that aren't included. Um, and the folks that we do work with, we have the same level of collaboration. And you include NYCHA? What's that? The New York City Housing Authority. Yes, NYCHA and Health and Hospitals are in the MMR. We include okay. NYCHA and do, Health and Hospitals. Do you include, right. what about a, a municipal institution that is not directly controlled by the mayor, but receives significant amounts of city funding, like, I don't know, the MTA, the, the, the specific, the section of the MTA that's specific to New York City. Would you, because it seems like the, the value of the mayor's management report lies in providing the city council with a base of information that can inform how we oversee these institutions that receive city funding or administer city services. And we do have an oversight function over the MTA, at least as it relates to the city, have you ever thought of including the MTA in the mayor's management report since it is receiving funding? Do we know if those dollars are being put to efficient use? I have not explored including the MTA um, in the MMR, and uh, I'd be happy to have some conversations about it. Um, it's, it's not part of the mandate, but we'd be open to looking at it. And is EDC included? Yes. Is HDC included? I don't, don't believe so. Okay, so it seems to me HDC should be included, right? Like we're... We have the largest housing plan in decades. HDC is a critical piece of the housing apparatus of the city. It would seem to me that we should know how HDC is distributing bond financing in the city. So that's something I would recommend. Um, what about, there's only so much efficiency that a, an agency can achieve within the status quo. What if there are necessary administrative or legislative changes that would enable an agency to be more efficient do you include those recommendations in the report? Have you ever thought of including those recommendations in the report? Because we don't provide recommendations in the report. This is the agency speaking about their performance. So we're not making recommendations via the report. Well, the, because I can imagine a report where you're not only including an agency's reporting of its own performance, but 
an agency's recommendations for the kind of administrative or legislative changes that would allow those agencies to be more efficient. Like, like I imagine NYCHA has ideas legislatively and administratively about how to improve its procurement processes, right? And it would be useful as a for me as a legislator to have access to that information. Uh, I, given the charter mandate, I'm not sure whether that would fit within sort of the particular parameters of this report. I can understand how the information would be useful. Um, but that's not what we ask of the agencies. We ask them to explain their performance. What about cooperation with the agencies? Um, I don't know if you're at liberty to say this, but I'm curious, which agencies are the least cooperative with as far as uh, the re forming the report? I'm just, I want we, you to out a few people. We have a great relationship with all of With the every agency is equally cooperative? Is that true? They, we work very well with all of them. Okay. Is there, is there at least one that you don't work for as well with? Um, and I just, I, I want your, your, your overall impressions. Um, is there, if I, if I were to ask you, is there a single area of inefficiency that, that stands out to you the most? What would that be? Like, what should, what should Councilmember Kalos and I know about? You mean within the agencies yeah. or in terms of any, any, Anything together? in this report that is, that the inefficiency is so glaring that I as a city council member should be aware of it. Um, I think that unless the city's running perfectly, I don't know. No, I wouldn't say that. I think that we put this book together so that we can make that information transparent to anyone who wants to look it up. Anything okay. notable? Anything that stands out to you that left an impression on you as someone who put together the report? Um, I'm not going to call any out specifically now. Tina, is there anything you want to flag? I'll ask the flip side of that question. Any 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 area of progress that was so notable that it's worth mentioning? Uh, we're making a lot of great progress. We're making a lot of progress. Okay, so I'm not going to get answers to my mischievous questioning, so I will, I will end it here, but thank you. Thanks. I, I, one of the areas for growth with regards to the mayor's management report would be to do a mayor's management report hearing with all the various uh, committee chairs and agencies here so that we could touch base with them on their performance in March and in... Much like we do with finance, I think that would be... Uh, yes, yeah. so that that is an idea to put out there. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Torres for his questions. I think we've, we've now had multiple committee chairs coming to ask questions beyond the scope of the structure, but also wanting to hear from the agencies. So uh, hoping that uh, in uh, 2018 we can come back with actually all the agencies so that we can focus on performance. Uh, so I'm going to continue on through uh, my questions. We appreciate the inclusion of the spending and budget information section at the end of each agency's section of the Mayor's Management Report, as well as the inclusion of applicable MMR goals that relate to units of appropriation, a U of A, within each agency. However, we have some recommendations as how this could be improved further. MMR indicators are tracked for fiscal years 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. In addition, there are targets for fiscal year 17 and 18. However, the spending and budget information is only included for fiscal years 16 and 17. We recommend that you include actual expenditures per unit of appropriation for all the past years for which the MMR indicators are tracked, as well as include units of appropriation budgets for the upcoming fiscal year in this case, fiscal year 18, to link MMR indicators with budget and spending information over time. Do you accept that recommendation? I'm uh, interested in exploring that recommendation. I, I can't speak to the budget process. I'm not a budget person and how difficult or easy it would be to add something like that in. I imagine it would actually be a space question, uh, less anything else we're asking to add the additional. So, so right now you have the columns for the, the performance targets, and now we'd just be asking to be able to track the budget for each fiscal year, and then that way we could actually look at it and see, did the unit of appropriations budget fluctuate, have any fluctuation, and did that fluctuation, we'd be able to see side by side the targets, performance, and the budget and that way we might be able to actually see if there was any link between the two.
I understand the recommendation. It will require further thinking in terms of how to appropriately fit it into the design process and production. In the spending and budget information section, there are columns for actual expenditures for fiscal year 2016 uh, and the most recent budgetary information for fiscal year 2017. Uh, the reason why actual expenditures are not included for fiscal year 17 is because these figures don't come out until after the MMR is released. Uh, fiscal, however, the most recent budget information for fiscal year 2017 is the closest we can get to actual spending given the time the MMR is released. Can you make this clear in the MMR that the modified budget column represents the most up-to-date budget information that serves as a proxy for actual expenditures for that year? Uh, we can figure out how to put together more explanatory text. Um, just want to point out also in the charter that the what it requires is the corresponding expenditure pursuant, you know, for the prior fiscal year, not for the actual fiscal year covered in the report. So that's one of the reasons why it appears as it does. Got it. <laughs> I'm glad we, now that we are following the charter, uh, my, my hope is that as we follow it to the letter that as was previously asked, the, the more we can add to the MMR to make it even better. Uh, so I think the, the hope here, now that we have some of the performance budgeting in there, is being able to actually compare budget versus actuals and see where we were in the budget and how that related to some of the performance. Next one. Adding the applicable MMR goals column to the agency's spending and budget information section is a good step forward in trying, in tying the MMR goals to the cost of fulfilling these goals. However, broad survey, a broad variety of programming is funded within each unit of appropriation, so the link between MMR indicators and spending is still quite tenuous. At least 10 agencies only have two units of appropriation. Uh, one for personal services, another for other than personal services, and therefore all of their MMR indicators are simply tied to both. However, the link between MMR indicators and agency spending is also tenuous for those agencies that have more expansive units of appropriation breakdowns. 103 units of appropriations matched all agency goals, and only 16 units of appropriation matched one goal. The last 151 units of appropriation are matched with at least two goals and up to eight goals. Uh, so you see where I'm going with that. Uh, for example, goal 5C in DCAS's section indicator, cumulative installed solar capacity in kilowatts. In the MMR, this indicator is linked to DCAS's energy management division's U unit of appropriation. Most of this division's budget is allocated towards paying the city's heat, light, and power bill, which is $682 million in fiscal year 17's modified budget, almost all of this division's expenditure budget. Most of the budget and spending associated with the city's efforts to install solar panels, however, are found in the capital budget spending and budgeting for which is not found in the MMR. Can indicators representing capital spending be linked to the budget and spending tied to these capital projects found in the city's capital budget? Not easy can, questions. Can you repeat that? <laughs> Just the end. Goal 5C is tied to an expense line in the budget, which is used to fund heat, light, and power. Uh, when we know that the solar program is being funded out of the capital budget. So we're asking you to include the capital budget uh, as part of the charter mandate to tie goals to spending. Thank you. Um, we'll, we will look into it. Great. Uh, and, and I think similarly, for those who are still watching at home or online, and I think our fourth estate, uh, the Gotham Gazette, which is uh, here reporting, uh, we have two budgets. We have our expense budget, which is $85 billion, and we have our capital budget, which is actually $90 billion. The item that people are most focused on day to day is the expense budget, but the capital budget's actually much larger. So um, by including the capital budget in here where we're using the capital budget to meet goals, I think that is uh, better along the lines. Uh, 
Another example is goal 1A in the law department section indicator, quote, total citywide payout for judgments and claims, end of quote. Uh, law department's tort division is responsible for defending the city against much of the judgment and claims cases brought against it, uh, excluding some types of cases such as medical malpractice. Can goal 1A be linked to the law department's budgeting and spending within the tort division, not just linked to the law department's budget and spending overall? I don't know the answer to that. We will look into it. Okay. I think the, the, with these both examples, the idea is to fix these issues, can you cite approximate cost figures for each goal? So perhaps turning it on its head instead of just listing out the unit of appropriations, can you work with the agencies and OMB to get a breakdown on how much are we spending on each goal? That would definitely be something we would have to speak with OMB about. Dean Foulihan just shuddered and doesn't know why yet. <laughs> Alternatively, can you indicate the approximate share of spending towards an MMR goal relative to overall U of A spending? That's another option. So you could break each goal out and then in that paragraph, you could, sorry, in that section, you could say goal 1A, 15%, goal 1B, 10%, and so on and so forth. I imagine it's a similar answer, but I need it. We're, we're taking note of all your suggestions, and we'll look into them. <laughs> uh, can you qualitatively explain the functions of each unit of appropriation so that readers can better contextualize how applicable MMR goals are connected to that unit of appropriation? We cannot. Um, I believe that would be a question for OMB or the agency. So, I, and I think that along the same lines, and, and uh, this one comes from my, my friends at the Citizens Budget Committee, uh, we're curious why for the MMR you chose units of appropriation versus uh, there is a budget function analysis, uh, which might also be able to help get at trying to tie budget appropriations to actual goals. So, any color commentary on why we chose units of appropriation versus budget function analysis or whether or not that can also be explored? Um, I think the, uh, as we mentioned before, we consulted with OMB and the law department about what could be included in these tables. Um, one of the things that we did, we went through several options as to what the right level of disaggregation should be or could be for reporting. One of the challenges about the budget function analysis is it does not cover all agencies that report in the MMR. It only covers a subset, about 15 or 16 agencies. And our understanding is it's, it is not clearly used uh, and as standardized, well understood, and consistently reported on as with the units of appropriation. And so that's one of the reasons why the U of, sorry, units of appropriation were the ones that we thought were most I apologize for this, appropriate for um, reporting on the spending and budget. Perfect. Uh, and, and just as a, a reminder to those watching online or at home or, or in the room, I often take questions from members of the press or, or people in attendance over, they submit the question by tweeting to at Ben Kalos or uh, emailing me. I generally try to do that, so um, just that that is there for those who are interested. Um, so. In terms of the budget, tying the budget to goals, where I would like to get to is performance budgeting. So I'm, I, there are a few members of the council who, who have a background in, in business. I, I'm one of them. And when I ran companies, if somebody came to me at my, so, so I, I'll give an example. I ran a drug rehab center in California. and. Uh, the marketing person said, Ben, we need to fill more beds. I need $10,000 a month, and if you give me $10,000 a month to spend on online advertising and other advertising, we will be able to fill 10 more beds, which will not only cover the marketing costs, but will cover more. And I said, that's great. Uh, let's try. So we put aside the $10,000. We filled 10 beds. We looked at whether or not we were getting an adequate return on investment. We were. We continued with the program. Uh, eventually, that marketing team did not work. We were not filling the number of beds we were supposed to, given the amounts of money we were laying out. We went with a new marketing team. Uh, how do we do that as a city of New York where we can tie the money that we are spending to specific results? 
That's a question for OMB. Um, we don't currently um, have a budget process that's performance-based, um, so we aren't able to report on it. I think changes like that would be a conversation with OMB. So, so the mayor has set a goal in the mayor's management report. Sorry, the mayor has set a goal of 200,000 units of affordable housing, 120,000 preserved, 80,000 new. Is that correct? That sounds right. And is that goal tracked in the MMR? Yes, if you look in the Housing New York collaboration chapter and also in HPD's chapter. So how much are we spending for each unit of affordable housing? We don't have that answer. Okay. But would you agree that that is something that somebody looking at the mayor's manager report should be able to see how much are we spending in the budget in order to achieve our goal? I understand that that's something that some folks are interested in seeing, and I can understand why. Um, whether it should be there, I, I don't have an answer for. And again, I think it's a conversation with OMB. I, 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 I've had that conversation with uh, uh, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, Dean Foulihan, for uh, I would say seven hearings across uh, four years. And uh, he has promised to, to meet with, with, with Mayor's Office of Operation, help facilitate this long promised meeting with the Office of Management and Budget to go over this specific topic. We look forward to a meeting. You, you got it. Uh, and um, we're, we're, I'm wrapping up on the questions. Uh, so this, this is going, this, this is actually one of the more positive hearings. We actually had a member come with, with compliments. Uh, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna turn to collaborative multi-agency projects. The quote collaborative Collaborating to deliver results, unquote, chapters offer great narratives on the collaborative efforts of multi-agency programming in the city, and there are details on the results, but the breakdown between agencies of specific tasks and goals is not always clear, specifically concerning time spent, division of tasks. Can this be clarified in future MMRs? You're gonna love this answer. We are happy to look into it. Um, We'll, we'll get back to you on that. But you, you see where we're coming from? Yep. Great. Additionally, the MMR does not provide spending and budget sections for the multi-agency initiatives in the same way as agency sections. I'm guessing because it's linked to your choice to use units of appropriation based on the agencies. Would it be possible to add these? Um, I don't know. We'll have a conversation about it. We were ex give me one moment. Just checking on the status of one of my colleagues. Uh, so we, we were expecting to be joined by the chair of the committee on uh, veterans, uh, council member Ulrich. Uh, he's been unable to join us. The Department of Veterans Services, which has been operating since April 2016, uh, was not included in the fiscal year 27 mayor's management report. Why was it not included, and can we expect the Department of Veterans Services to be included in an upcoming PMMR or MMR? Um, that is correct. Um, DVS was not included. Um, it's a new agency, um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, new agencies aren't created very often, and it takes them some time to ramp up. Um, we decided jointly with them that it didn't make sense to include them this year. Um, they're doing um, indicator development and data collection, and we did not have information available for an entire fiscal year. Um, we continue to work with them. Their data systems are in development, and we expect to have them included in the upcoming PMMR. We're going to move on to methodology, which is, I think, one of the last lines of questioning. The mayor's management report notes uh, that core sampling changed from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 17. Uh, can you share how that changed and do you find that the new sampling method provides a better picture of the actual customer experience at city agencies? Uh, 
So um, the core sampling methodology in fiscal 17 um, reverts back to the format that we used in fiscal 15 and prior to that. Um, in fiscal 16, we, instead of going to all of the service centers um, and facilities that agencies um, operate, we decided to focus in on uh, a targeted set, a subset of those facilities, um, and specifically ones that were rated more poorly uh, so that we wouldn't return to facilities that were already performing very well with scores of 100. We decided, based on feedback that we got from you and other members of the committee, that it, that change in methodology in that sampling was somewhat confusing, and it made sense to us to go back to the prior method of going to all the facilities instead and reporting in the way that we had previously. We have not seen, but looking at overall scores or agency by agency, that there was much difference in fiscal 16 in terms of the actual scores. Um, but we did decide to move back to the prior sampling technique for uh, ease of understanding. So while the sampling method changed from year to year and a note is present, the data remains side by side in the five-year table showing what we're concerned might be a misleading rate of change in core scores between fiscal year 15, 16, and 17. Can you make this different clearer in the future, perhaps using colors or a note or a symbol to indicate that fiscal year 16 should be separate and distinctly considered or that it just has a different methodology? Well, we'll consider some options. When a methodology or measurement for an indicator changes, how do you indicate to readers and for how many years is it shared with readers? So as you noted earlier, there is a section within agencies about noteworthy changes that appears for that particular report. Um, this is one of the challenges in making clear to people what effects might be had or what indicators were introduced at what time because the next report provides that information for that years or that time period. With regards to core survey, so you're, you're going to actual facilities, the numbers seem quite high based on how, what people's lived experience might be. Uh, in 2008, this, as I've been informed by the Citizens Budget Commission, uh, the City of New York undertook a survey uh, with I believe the National Research Center, and they asked residents a series of questions. And in those questions, the city didn't do so well. And as a result, the city chose not to repeat that. Uh, and so uh, earlier this year in May, the Citizens Budget Commission decided to conduct that very near same survey again, uh, sending it to 72,000 households with a 13% uh, response rate and uh, the city did not fare too well. In some places, uh, things were great. Uh, the parks chair would be happy to hear that uh, one of the highest marks was that 85% of the city felt safe in a park playing during the day. Uh, but when asked uh, whether or not the city spends tax dollars wisely, uh, that was perhaps the one of the worst performers at uh, 20 percent. Only one in five New Yorkers thinks that we're spending the tax dollars wisely. Uh, and uh, in terms of quality of life indicators, 20 percent of New Yorkers, the, the lowest was traffic. People are incredibly unhappy with uh, the traffic. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, worst in, the worst indicator was at 13 percent uh, felt that uh, services for, for homeless people were adequate. Is, is the Mayor's Office of Operations interested in doing a similar type of survey uh, to hear from the uh, residents how they are interfacing with various different agency indicators or just overall? We don't have any plans um, to do a survey. I uh, find that survey that you just mentioned very interesting and I'd love to 
learn more about it if there's anything you could send our way or we can probably find it online. Um, I'm not sure if there's a need to recreate the wheel if it's already been done, but I think we could probably learn a lot from what has already been gathered. I, I, I would love to put the Citizens Budget Commission out of business on this particular report and uh, take it over from them. Uh, and then uh, at a previous hearing, we had mentioned trying to do a, a training on the Mayor's Management Report for the City Council. I understand that we're trying to select a day in the next coming month, and I appreciate that, and we'll move forward with these students. We will follow up with additional questions. We look forward to working with you on OMB. Uh, as, as you've heard from multiple members, we're, the, the document was great to begin with. It's getting better every time. Uh, we're all perfectionists, which means we always want to improve on perfection. So uh, thank you for the great work that you've been doing. We look forward to working with you, and then we also hope uh, as, as we brought up with multiple members who also may or may not happen to be running for speaker, trying to grow the mayor's management report hearings from beyond a structural conversation to actually having a focus by the council on agency performance uh, at um, multiple points per year. Right now the council tends to focus on the budget during the budget hearing when the pre-MMR is included. And then after that, uh, an, there tends to be a focus on specific topics rather than on overall performance. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you. Look forward to working with you. Looking thank forward you. to your moving from, from acting to director. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. We will excuse you. Our next panel is uh, Our next panel is Mariana Alexander from the Citizens Budget Commission and Lindsay Goldman from the New York Academy of Medicine. Uh, this is our final panel. If anyone is here to testify, please make sure to fill out one of these appearance cards. If uh, you have any comments which you wish to be, have included in the record, and it is October 18th, 2017, uh, you can feel free to email policy at bencalos.com and we will add your comment to the record. Mariana, if you wish to begin. So you've taken a lot of my points, but I'll still give my testimony. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Mariana Alexander. I am a research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. CBC is a nonpartisan. Is that better? Okay. <laughs> so, my name is Mariana Alexander. I'm a research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. CBC is a nonpartisan civic organization whose mission is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York State and New York City government. The fiscal year 17 Mayor's Management Report, MMR, published in mid-September of 2017, is intended to inform the public and this City Council about the volume and quality of services that the City provides. Since the MMR's inception, CBC has followed the report's evolution closely, making recommendations on how it can be strengthened and using its content to inform our work. CBC has previously advocated that the MMR should increase emphasis on outcomes by tracking the impact services have rather than merely reporting inputs and outputs. Two, focus on efficiency by developing unit cost measures in every service area. Three, meaningfully connect spending on services with service outcomes so that investments are better informed by agency performance. And four, develop citizen satisfaction measures. Progress on these recommendations has been mixed. Some agencies have increased their reporting of outcome measures, adding insight into performance, particularly the social service agencies. But still, several agencies report no outcome measures focusing solely on input and output. In terms of focusing on efficiency, the report's inclusion of unit cost measures has regressed. So when CBC first recommended that the MMR should include unit cost measures, 16 agencies reported a total of 48 unit cost measures. Since then, in the fiscal 17 MMR, only 10 agencies reported a total of 40 unit cost measures. The city has made more progress in developing the performance budgeting function of the MMR. Uh, so CBC is pleased to see that the city council integrates MMR metrics in its preliminary budget reports. 
and that the Mayor's Office of Operations included agency budgeted spending by unit of appropriation linked to the relevant indicators in the MMR. However, units of appropriation are often too broadly defined to assess programmatic spending. The city should focus instead on linking indicators uh, with spending categories as reported in the budget function analysis. And that report should be expanded beyond the 15 agencies it currently includes. So CB CBC reiterates these previous recommendations uh, that the MMR focus on cost efficiency, enhance reporting of service outcomes, and meaningfully connect spending with outcomes. In its review of the MMR, CB CBC finds a critical perspective to be missing from its pages, and that's of the city's residents. So only 35 of the approximately 2,000 indicators in the report capture the public's perception of or satisfaction with city services. These 35 indicators ask residents to rate their experience with a particular service, so for example, inpatient satisfaction at New York City Health and Hospitals. And these limited measures capture only a small share of the services provided by the city. Uh, and this leads to a gap in our understanding of the city's performance and whether it's meeting resident needs. So to begin that, fill that gap, CBC enlisted the National Research Center, NRC, to conduct a citywide survey of resident satisfaction in January of 2017. The survey results were mailed to all city council members and community boards. The NRC performed a nearly identical survey at the behest of the city in 2008, providing a benchmark to assess change over time. The survey was distributed to 72,000 households with about 10,000 households responding. So that was a sufficiently robust sample size to allow for comparisons between boroughs, community districts, and demographic variables. So a brief overview of the survey results revealed that only 44% of New Yorkers surveyed rated the overall quality of New York City government services as excellent or good. When asked to rate specific services, responses varied widely. Residents were positive about fire and emergency medical services, household garbage pickup, and libraries, but expressed dissatisfaction with street and road maintenance, public education, and the social safety net. Survey results for satisfaction with individual city services showed statistically significant variation from 2008 for 11 of the 21 city services queried. However, overall satisfaction with city services was not statistically significantly different. Uh, half of the respondents, 51%, considered quality of life to, in New York City to be good or excellent. Um, Respondents reported adequate access to healthcare services and they, that they feel safe in parks and subways, but were less positive, positive about cleanliness of neighborhoods, rack control, street noise, air quality, and traffic. The quality of life and service satisfaction met metrics give us important data about the public's perception of city government performance and whether it's meeting resident needs. Pairing survey results with existing MMR indicators would add depth to the report and lend insight into current indicators. For example, a key metric at the Department of Sanitation, I think this gets to the dog feces conversation from earlier, um, is the share of city streets rated acceptably clean. In the fiscal 17 MMR, 95.9% .9 of streets met cleanliness standards. However, CPC's survey indicated that nearly 20% of respondents described the cleanliness of their neighborhoods uh, as poor. In addition, 53.2% of non-Hispanic whites rated their neighborhoods cleanliness as excellent or good, compared to only 40.6% of black or African American respondents. To begin to integrate resident feedback into the MMR, CBC makes the following recommendations. One is to conduct regular surveys that capture perception about quality of life and municipal services in order to me measure progress over time. Two is to incorporate resident satisfaction metrics in each agency's MMR reporting and to design survey questions to validate and or add depth to current metrics. Three is to encourage agencies to respond directly to survey results, develop action plans to address resident concerns relevant to their missions, and be held accountable for lack of progress on relevant measures. And four is develop survey represent, surveys that are representative of the city's demographic and geographic diversity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Chairman Kalos and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Lindsay Goldman, and I am the Director of Healthy Aging at the New York Academy of Medicine. 
Established in 1847, the Academy addresses the health challenges facing New York City and the world's rapidly growing urban populations. Since 2007, the Academy has served as the Secretariat for Age-Friendly NYC, a partnership with the City Council and the Mayor's Office to maximize the social, physical, and economic engagement of older people to improve their health and well-being and strengthen communities. We solicit feedback from older New Yorkers across eight domains of city life identified by the World Health Organization to determine where there are barriers to full participation. In response, the administration convenes multiple city agencies to address aging-related challenges by enhancing existing activities and planning processes. These convenings resulted in the 59 initiatives for an age-friendly NYC in 2009, and most recently, the 2017 Age-Friendly NYC New Commitments for a City for All Ages, published in July. Some of the improvements made by Age-Friendly NYC include a reduction in senior pedestrian fatalities by 16%, increased walkability through the addition of public seating, new programming for older people at parks, educational and cultural institutions, and a better consumer experience at many local businesses. The Academy applauds the, council, applauds the Council's commitment to ensuring the Mayor's Management Report is an accurate reflection of the, administrative's, of the administration's priorities, achievements, and areas for improvement. Age-Friendly NYC was included in the MMR in the Agencies Working Together section from 2013 through 2014. Though the current MMR has a section on collaborating to deliver results, Age-Friendly NYC has not been included. While some of the collaborative initiatives as well as the individual agency chapters do address older New Yorkers, there are very few corresponding performance indicators beyond units of service delivered by the Department for the Aging. <coughs> DIFTA services, used by approximately 17% of the city's eligible 1.4 million people aged 60 and older, are certainly critical, but are only one component of a high-quality later life. The fundamental goal of Age-Friendly NYC is to promote age-inclusive policies, environments, and amenities across all aspects of later life. The Mayor's Management Report provides an opportunity to track specific, measurable outputs and outcomes not currently being monitored through other forms of accountability, such as One NYC and the Department for the Aging's annual report. New York City is recognized as one of the founders and leaders of the age-friendly movement, which now includes over 500 localities across the world, most of which have been directly or, influenced, directly or indirectly influenced by our efforts. The city has an obligation to regularly assess and modify our interventions to ensure optimal impact. The Academy respectfully recommends that age-friendly NYC performance measures be reinstated in the report. The Academy would be pleased to leverage our expertise in evaluation, applied research, and aging and health policy to help identify and operationalize appropriate metrics for inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the Academy of Medicine. Do you know if Age Friendly NYC has ever been included in the Mayor's Management Report previously? Yes. It was included in the 2013 report, and then it was included in the preliminary report in February of 2014, and then it disappeared. I, I would be interested, would the Academy of Medicine be interested in working with myself as well as the Chair for Aging, Margaret Chin, on uh, advocating for it being included in the PMMR for this coming year? That's why we're here, yes. Okay, so we will include it in our committee follow-up to the uh, Mayor's Office of Operations, uh, seeing as they have left us, and we will also pass your testimony, if you email your testimony at policy at bencables.com, or we'll pass it along. Uh, what would you like to see included in the age-friendly NYC uh, section? Would you like them to just reiterate what was there in 2013, or would no. you have changes? No, we have changes because some of the indicators that were included in the earlier MMR um, were uh, a reflection of the 2009 age-friendly commitments, which we were thrilled to have renewed um, in 2017. The new commitments, there are about 80 of them, so it will be a process of determining what the most appropriate metrics will be. Um, but we want to ensure that the metrics 
are consistent with the new initiatives, some of which are different because um, it's a different time period, and so the initiative has certainly evolved to meet the changing needs of the population. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to Citizens Budget Commission. I, I believe that our uh, asking questions about the quality of the streets was purely by accident and uh, by virtue of one of my colleagues complimenting them on how good the streets were while uh, both my lived experience, that of my constituents, as well as uh, your survey found it different. So I guess first question, what type of transparency would you want to see from the mayor's management report around the core methodology for you to have better confidence in the results or at least be able to explain the huge divergence between your survey results and their core results? So you're referring to the core facility and customer satisfaction measures. Um, I think it's a little bit unclear the process through which the they t do these surveys, the number of surveys, um, the kinds of questions, also what, what are the standards for clean and not clean, would all, or you know, a good customer service experience versus a not good experience? Could be better defined. So in academia, uh, I know that when, in, when information is collected, so, so when Citizens Budget Commission published your report with the survey results, I believe you included a copy of your survey, is that correct? Uh, yes, we did. And, and uh, just for the Academy of Medicine, when a medical publication publishes the results of a survey, I believe the surveys are also included. That's correct. So it seems like the core survey information, the, the, the surveys themselves for each agency should be included, and what is the current, when uh, Citizens Budget Commission, when you released your survey results, what types of information, you released the information by zip code, is that correct, or uh, you, you had the findings by r race, gender, ethnicity, and zip code? Uh, community board, or community district. Community district. Uh, in current uh, medical, Surveys, how is the information broken down based on current academic standards? So I am definitely not an expert on medical studies. I'm not a doctor. Um, but I will say that when the academy looks at data, we are increasingly using the neighborhood tabulation areas because they're a smaller unit of geography than the community boards. So while the city is organized by community boards and a lot of people identify as being part of a particular community board and it's a convenient unit of analysis, um, neighborhood tabulation areas are a little bit smaller. So you can see the nuances between a certain part of one community board and a part of you know the same community board but where there may be uh, different populations residing. I know that there is a report because I've viewed it that breaks down some of the some of the budget information and some of the uh, performance information based on community district. So I believe we might want to tie that into the MMR a little bit more uh, clearly, as well as including the surveys and also including the results as, as much as possible. And then actually asking them to describe their methodology on how they collected it and whether it was, as, as you did in your Citizens Budget Commission report, you actually said we, we, we mailed a letter to 75,000 randomly sampled households versus we paid somebody to walk around once a month and take a survey of the street conditions and so on and so forth. Um, I think one of the items that you've brought in terms of your third recommendation, I think, is something that we're hoping to do moving forward, which is based on feedback from the uh, two chairs of similar committees. Uh, try to make sure that the mayor's management report actually gets specific attention with the committee by committee response so that committees act, sorry so that agencies actually have to respond and uh, we will also consider whether or not we can encourage the committee committee chairs and councils to do follow-ups this year 
to the various agencies asking them uh, to respond to concerns that may be brought to their attention in the uh, reports as we're negotiating several <laughs> pieces of legislation. Uh, how would you alter some of the, uh, the MMR with regards to demographics and geography? Well, I think currently the MMR doesn't do much to report di differentially based on, on geography, and I think that that is a really important aspect to all of this. I think the survey, uh, one of the more interesting things coming out of the survey was the discrepancy between different community districts, um, and particularly for an administration that has rightly prioritized equitable distribution of city services. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and so we, we had a willingness from the acting director of the mayor's office of operations to work with Citizens Budget Commission. Will you send them a copy of your report? Will you send them a copy of the underlying data and breakdown so that they can try to see why your survey is finding drastically different results than their core ratings? Yes, I certainly will. Great. And do you believe that if we had performance budgeting as is intended by the New York City Charter, where we actually tied cleaner streets or affordable housing or pre-K seats or any of the mayor's goals to how much money we're spending on them, that the uh, rating for how we are spending tax dollars might be higher? I mean, I think there certainly is progress towards that goal being made, but I, you rightly focused on um, kind of the vagueness of how spending is currently reported, and that is in OMB's, you know, court to, to address that. So I think more could be done. Perfect. I want to thank uh, the Citizens Budget Commission for your uh, ongoing advocacy around customer service and making sure that the city is actually governing based on people's lived experience as well as spending and making sure we're being responsible with tax dollars. I want to uh, welcome the New York Academy of Medicine to the Governmental Operations Committee. I look forward to working with you to uh, restoring the age-friendly NYC to the Mayor's Management Report along with our Chair of Aging. Uh, if anyone has additional testimony, please feel free to send it by uh, midnight on October 18th, 2017 to policy at Ben Kalos, and I hereby adjourn this committee hearing.